Okay, thanks for tuning in. We're going to take a quick look at risk management. This presentation will help you understand risk assessment and risk management, and policy and regulation, what we do once we know that there's a risk associated with something. Note, many of the ideas here you won't be directly tested on, except where I've noted, know this. So by risk, we mean the mathematical probability that some harmful outcome will result from a given action, event, or substance. And probability means a quantitative description of the likelihood of a certain outcome. 100% would mean um, it's going to happen, 0% not going to happen. And by harmful outcome, we could mean injury, death, environmental damage, economic loss, etc. A little FYI about how our perception of risk tends not to match statistical reality. Take a look at smoking 20 cigarettes a day, which on average takes off 2,370 days off your life, or almost seven or eight years compared to an airplane accident, which many people are extremely fearful of, which has a very low risk. In risk assessment, we are analyzing risk quantitatively, trying to come up with a probability of, um, of a harmful outcome. It measures and compares risk involved in different activities or substances and helps identify and prioritize serious risks. So maybe we'll accept small risks, um, but not more serious risks. And it helps determine threats posed to humans, wildlife, and ecosystems. So in risk assessment, this involves dose response analysis or other tests of toxicity and assessing the level of exposure to that hazard or toxin in terms of the concentration of it, the time, the frequency. And so these are just things that tie into determining an overall level of risk. Once we know that, we can begin to manage that risk. Let me take a, a look at um, information from private citizens, industry, nonprofit, and interest groups. So we're really doing some cost-benefit analysis here. Will we accept some cost of risk by experiencing some benefits? Maybe there's a chemical that just works so good at um, preventing things from burning, yet um, we know it's toxic, but it will still be used in some building materials and things like that. Okay, then we get into policy making. Once we've learned how to manage the risk, then we come up with some decisions about um, uh, what kind of laws will allow or how much of that product will allow to be used and under what conditions. There are two basic philosophical approaches to this. You can assume it's harmless until shown to be harmful, and this is called the innocent until proven guilty. Or you can assume it's harmful until shown to be harmless. This is the precautionary principle. Let's take a look at those. So let's say you've um, just come up with an alternative product, product um, in blue compared to the green, I mean the purple. So you've done some industrial research and development to come up with this product. You have done some pre-market testing by industry, government, and academic scientists to show that, okay, we think it's safe. And that's sort of limited testing. Then consumers use it. Some products, um, uh, let's see here found that some products are harmful to humans. So then you start doing some more post-market after it's already been introduced to the market testing more rigorously. And you might find that it is an unsafe product. It's recalled, taken off the shelves, and, um, and so now it's no longer being used. But there was a period of time when it was being used before it was shown to be really unsafe. This would be innocent until proven guilty. But here we have the precautionary principle same idea, only you do your rigorous testing up front. And so only the safest products are brought to market. And this cause, this allows minimal impact on human health. So the basic idea is that industry often has pressured government to take an innocent until proven guilty approach because it lets them get products to the marketplace that they know will be really effective at what they want to do. But environmental advocates have pressured government to follow the precautionary principle to try to um, slow down, do rigorous testing first. So these you definitely need to know. And um, what are some federal agencies that manage, manage risk? Um, in the US, most risk management is conducted by federal and state agencies, particularly the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and the FDA, Food and Drug Administration. Let's take a look at what these do. Key agencies and the products they regulate, the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, um, they regulate food, or at least food additives, cosmetics, drugs, and medical devices, and you do need to know these. You should be aware that 
GM crops are considered to be close enough to the regular crop that they don't have to test it. And that was a really important decision made by the Supreme Court um, in the late 90s that really opened the door for increased use of GM crops because now they did not have to be tested. And the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, tests pesticides and industrial chemicals and any synthetic chemicals not covered by other agencies. And OSHA, Occupational Health and Safety Administration, takes care of workplace hazards, making sure that the workplace is a safe place to be. And um, it also does things like in our science rooms, we have the um, this, these eye wash stations and the, um, the showers in case you get a chemical spilled on you. That's something that OSHA would require. So what about the regulation of pesticides? Um, pesticides to be introduced to the market need to be registered with the EPA. You can't just go spraying anything. And registration involves risk assessment and risk management. So you are assessing how much risk, and then you're saying, well, okay, so how much of this will we allow to be used? Uh, in what concentrations? Under what conditions? The EPA assesses research from the manufacturer, along with any outside research. But usually manufactured research on their product is, um, is definitely biased. They would like to see their product go, or at least you should assume it's biased until you further investigate. They want to see their product get to marketplace. And the EPA can set restrictions on use or even ban a product. So um, keep in mind here that the EPA is charged with monitoring 75,000 industrial chemicals that have been produced. This is too many chemicals in too little time, people, and resources to be able to analyze all of them. So only 10% of chemicals on the market are thoroughly tested. Only 2% of them are screened for being carcinogens or mutagens or tratogens. And less than 1% are government regulated. The rest can be used under any condition. And about 0% are tested for endocrine, nervous, or immune effects. And none are tested for synergistic effects. So even though I'm not going to directly test you on this, these are good things to keep in mind. This is the list of the dirty dozen POPs. That's persistent um, organic pollutant. And you can see DDT is here. Many of these are insecticides, as you can see. Dioxins are another big one, so that's an industrial byproduct. And um, PCBs are an industrial chemical used um, for a variety of uses, many of them related to the electronics industry. So I'd like you to write a summary at the end of your notes for this, and I'll see you tomorrow in class.